I'm glad to, to introduce you today to uh, a, a white paper about human energy. Um, there will be additional material with which you can uh, even contribute on this URL, uh, tinyurl.com slash n2conf, or you can scan the QR code with your smartphone if you like. And this is uh, in collaboration with uh, some of the, of the advisory board of uh, human energy. Since it's a lunch talk, I thought we'll take the theme of a, of a lunch. The, for the entree, I propose you to tell you a bit more about myself. The main course will be the white paper, of course, and a surprise for dessert. So, who am I? I'm a, uh, I like to describe myself as a big questions philosopher, and I use both insights from uh, science and philosophy to tackle the, the, the biggest questions. And uh, my book is in, entitled uh, The Beginning and the End, The Meaning of Life in a Cosmological Perspective. And uh, since 2019, uh, I'm a human energy member and, uh, and consultant. So the work uh, I did on the noosphere is um, first a, a, a paper about Teilhard de Chardin, uh, both uh, showing its, his visionary aspect and its, his controversial aspects. And what I did also is a, is a detailed analysis of the, of the core paper uh, about the noosphere, which is called uh, the formation of the noosphere. And I just took it as if Taylor Chandon sent me an email with this paper, and I replied systematically to, 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 to the whole text, and trying also to to update and to make sense of, uh, of what he wrote in, in light of what we know today. I also wrote a short paper uh, about the idea of um, reintroducing the, the direction of evolution. I will talk about it later also. And uh, there is one paper that is still under review, which is called What is the Noosphere? Um, uh, planetary Superorganism, Major Evolutionary Transition and Emergence. So you might have noticed that people have some kind of sometimes different definitions of, of the noosphere, and it's, it's in, in itself a, a tricky uh, thing to, to, to just define the, the noosphere. And this paper is, a, is an attempt to, to do just that using uh, modern uh, scientific frameworks. I also worked on uh, ethical aspects with uh, Francis. We wrote a paper called Ethics and Complexity, why standard ethical frameworks cannot cope with socio-technological change. So we criticize the traditional ethical frameworks. And more recently, I, I published a paper which is called uh, Extending Planetary Health, Global Ethics and Global Governance in the Noosphere, uh, that tries to, to expand the notion of planetary health, which is uh, becoming a bit popular, but yeah, uh, that I found a bit restrictive too. Then I have also some um, popular pieces. One is a, uh, it's a outreach article, which is called What is the Noosphere? It's on the Human Energy uh, website. And uh, I'm glad uh, it's the second hit when you uh, type in Noosphere on, on Google. I, I still have to beat Wikipedia. And another more uh, speculative outreach uh, article um, at the intersection of ChatGPT, the Noosphere, and uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. So, uh, the white paper. I will start by, by going through three very essential concepts of human energy. You have heard of them, but I will go through them again. First is the noosphere, then the techno-social dilemma, and then the three stories of the universe. If we just stick to the etymology of the term noosphere, we, we can see or think uh, of the noosphere as, as uh, a developmental stage of, uh, of planet Earth, starting with a geosphere, then a biosphere comes on top, and then with humans, intelligence, and the internet, there is a noosphere that is forming. Uh, however, this, this view is, is a bit uh, too simplistic to my taste, and um, I think that the, the the idea of a global superorganism is much richer. Um, and so Gregory Stock uh, wrote this, uh, this book, Metaman, the merging of humans and machines into a global superorganism, which is still a, a great overview of, of, um, 
of seeing the, what's happening uh, as, as the emergence of a, of a superorganism. And it's really, when you read Taylor de Chardin in detail, he, he's not speaking just about a sphere of thought that is emerging, he's really speaking about a superorganismic uh, dynamic. So in, in this book by uh, Gregory, I don't know where you are. Uh, yeah, you just made a typo, I'm sorry to say. It was no sphere, the merging. <laughs> A human and machine into a global superorganism. Why I think um, the noosphere is a, is a quite unique concept is because it's at the intersection of the Anthropocene discourse, uh, recognizing that humans have a global impact uh, at the inter and then with at the intersection of Gaia theory, the idea that Earth, planet Earth has planetary feedback loops and the vision of the technological singularity that saying that technological growth and evolution are, are really major and transformative for, for our planet. And generally those, those three discourses, they, they are isolated uh, within each other, whereas the noosphere has really the potential and brings them together. Next, the techno-social dilemma. Uh, <clears throat> simply, what, what does it mean? It means the loss of identity, meaning, coherence and direction in our science and technology age. Uh, its roots are first and foremost the, the what's called, what has been called the techno-cultural lag. It's the difference in pace between technological progress that goes very quickly versus uh, social progress that is much slower to adapt. So, And another core reason of, of this problem is that uh, scientific insight, scientific knowledge, uh, did erode uh, religious faith and religious beliefs. And the consequence is uh, 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 that our worldview becomes become com um, more confused, frag fragmented. We have fear, anxiety, and, uh, and nowadays a, a very strong uh, collapse atmosphere. And uh, Francis will go through the techno-social dilemma in much more detail uh, tomorrow. And so we need new stories, new, new narratives. The three stories of the universe, um, Ben mentioned them uh, at the uh, pr first presentation, uh, but um, let me remind you, the first story uh, are re the, the religious narratives. The second story is a traditional scientific worldview. And the third story is an emerging scientific worldview that incorporates modern evolutionary and complexity science to inspire and give meaning. So that's what we are focusing on with human energy. So what are the, the strengths of religious narratives? Well, first, it's uh, that it gives psychological certainty. It gives emotional and social support for billions of humans. And it's extremely resilient through time. So it's, it's a system that provides meaning, values, and explanation of the world. But it has um, weaknesses. It's largely incompatible with, with science. And it has outdated traditional values, such as suppressing non-believers or heretics, subduing nature, etc. And the, the, you can see the, the work of modern theologian is precisely to palliate these weaknesses and to update religious beliefs to, to make them more compatible with science, to make the, the, the value system more adapted to our current context and situation. Then the second story, the, the traditional scientific worldview. So by that, I mean the more Newtonian worldview, reductionistic, analytical kind of uh, thinking very mathematized, that implies determinism. Mm. And uh, the, 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 of course, the scientific revolution uh, was a, a great moment in human history, and it, it, it also unlocked uh, shared methods and values of inquiry. And that's why science is a collective enterprise. It has enabled technology. And uh, and this is a bit of a paradox. It, it gives the most certain kind of knowledge, scientific knowledge, but the process itself to get to this knowledge is extremely uncertain the, 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 in the sense that the scientists are, are the most, they need to, to be doubtful about everything, about everyone to, 
to, uh, to uncover the, the, the hidden assumptions. And so the great weaknesses of more scientifically grounded worldviews is that there is no purpose or values for, for humans, and often the questions of ethics and values are explicitly rejected uh, from the domain of science even. And also it's most often, most of science still today is very reductionistic. So it's a, it speaks about small models, small cases, and it misses uh, the big picture. Uh, and the core problem is that, of course, these scientific and religious stories are in conflict. I just gave you a, an overview, but the, um, the, the situation is more uh, complex and uh, in the... <laughs> This is a, 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 more, a more detailed analysis that I did uh, of, the, of these two stories. And you can, uh, you can, you can download this PDF uh, of, of the logic of the two stories and how they are in contradiction um, from the, the QR code. And that, that will show also at the end, so don't worry. So the first story, what is, what is it? So it's uh, founded on modern evolutionary and complexity science that provides uh, precisely the scientific tools to think the, the, the big picture. One of the core elements of it is to, to find a, a di direction in evolution toward, which is uh, towards greater integration and complexity um, from the earliest cells to complex social animals and, and nowadays the, the global society. So in this view, humans are active participants not just subject to rigid laws of God or rigid laws of nature even. And humans can act to continue this cooperation on, on, on larger and larger scales. And uh, the next larger scale, of course, is the noosphere. What are its weaknesses? Well, it's not developed enough, it's not known and applied enough, and it needs more stories, more ritual to, to, to yeah, to, to grow. So the goals of human energy are, are not about trying to solve directly outstanding global issues such as climate change, but rather it's to provide the noosphere vision for our planetary future, to propose a source of meaning, coherence, and a powerful narrative for global stewardship. So it's to provide vision principles and frameworks that support global integration, within which then those specific global issues can be solved. What are the tactics and strategies of human energy? There are four of them, uh, outreach, science, ethics, and education. So in terms of outreach, the main uh, product is a human energy YouTube channel that has um, 9,400 subscribers and 1.4 million views. A round of applause for our team that has achieved this. More specifically, the, the channel features the story of the Noosphere series, which is uh, a set of 37 videos directed by Brian Swim and his team and also the Science of the Noosphere series, which is a set of 25 interviews with uh, various scientists directed by David Stone Wilson. Uh, but there are also other kind of outreach um, efforts, such as, for example, the, an art science and play in the Noosphere event that happened uh, a few weeks ago in, uh, in Brussels. So to try to mix art with the idea of the, the Noosphere and academic conferences, workshops, a digital newsletter, podcast, social media, and various partnerships with other nonprofit and media outlets. Um, on the science part, the, you may say that the, the cosmological context and inspiration for the noosphere is mostly dealt with, with the work of uh, Brian Swim. Uh, then there is uh, the development of key uh, evolutionary concepts such as ma uh, major evolutionary transition or the directionality in evolution. This is a topic that interests uh, many of the scientists, such as uh, Terence Deacon, uh, Davidson Wilson, uh, Francis, and myself. But there is also um, 
uh, a paper about cognitive science and consciousness models applied to the neurosphere that was made by uh, Francis Elegant and, and uh, Shima Beiji. And recently, a paper about the, the techno-social dilemma that um, Francis will present tomorrow. Also, an important part of the science is generally to update uh, Taylor de Chardin. Uh, so two papers on, of mine are cited here, and, and uh, also a very interesting um, set of papers uh, started with uh, this, um, this target paper, which is um, called Reintroducing Pierre Teilhard de Chardin to Modern Evolutionary Science by David Sloan Wilson. And uh, it, it, it went through the most interesting form of scientific publication, which is called Open Peer Commentary. So um, some other scholars were invited to, to comment and criticize the paper. Um, and, um, and with finally a, a reply from, from David. So, so that's, that's a great way to get different perspectives. And I also put the, the PDF in the, in, the, in the link. I recommend you to, to explore this. Then track, track C about ethics. Well, I, I mentioned this paper about uh, extending planetary health and how to actually care for planet Earth in a, in a more um, systematic way, an uh, encompassing way. Uh, I was glad to see that Luis Avary gave a talk about ethics uh, yesterday. Uh, and of course, ethics needs to ultimately need to, to, to change in action. And, and so that, that I think it's wonderful that uh, Human Energy has teamed up with ProSocial, which is an organization um, trying to, to steward positive cultural evolution in any group of, on Earth. Um, and yes, so here the, the challenge would be to possibly apply the same kind of methodology, but at, at a planetary scale. But there is more work needed in, in, in ethics. It's for sure that uh, the noosphere uh, is opening tons of issues, and we need more framework and more, more ideas to, to deal with them. In terms of education, uh, David Sloan Wilson uh, led a, a master class called the Science, Science of the Noosphere. It was a huge success with more than 180 online participants. Um, there was also uh, there are also pilot educational projects by uh, Ellen Rigsby at St. Mary's College and uh, Michael Pearson at uh, Fordham University. And Marta Lenarkovich also did uh, led some educational workshops in uh, in Brussels to try to incorporate uh, the Noosphere ID into directly the, the educators and how this may help them to, to teach. We've come to the dessert. <laughs> so since it's uh, an uh, anniversary, of course we should have a birthday cake. <laughs> So what I propose is to work together towards writing uh, an open letter entitled The Noosphere and, and Its Significance for the Survival of Humanity. And the ultimate goal would be to publish this in a high-impact science magazine such as Nature or, or Science. So the purpose is to really to trigger debate and interest about the Noosphere and also reconnect uh, evolutionary science with the planetary scale. So Human Energy has published many papers on many topics on many fronts, but I think it's now the time is ripe for an authoritative piece to, to promote the Noosphere. So I will outline the general gist of the, of the letter, but I'm, uh, I'm recalling for your feedback and input you have ideas how to make it better. So the, the Noosphere, the birth of the Noosphere ID was 100 years ago. And, and we know that uh, the direction of evolution is toward more integration and complexity. But the beginning of the formation of the internet uh, 
yes, it has already been actualized with globalization and, uh, um, sorry, the beginning of the formation of the noosphere has already uh, been actualized largely with globalization and, uh, and the rise of the internet. However, we have failed to, to recognize or we forget to recognize the broader evolutionary significance of the noosphere and how humans may find meaning and purpose in this great transition. So, modern science has reconstructed the evolutionary trajectory um, produced by the successive integration of small-scale entities into larger entities of greater complexity. This logic makes it very clear that an evolutionary transition at the planetary scale is currently underway. I think that's something uh, that all my colleagues who work on these issues have recognized and that we need to really emphasize. And however, given that humanity is beset by existential threats, um, science-based worldviews are, are dominated not by hope and meaning, but by an atmosphere of meaninglessness, extinction, extinctions, and, uh, and doom. So there is uh, an imperative to reintroduce this broader evolutionary vision into academic discourse. And, and evolutionary science has matured well beyond its, uh, its initial narrow gene-centric view, especially with uh, fields of, uh, and studies about cultural evolution, about technological evolution. And also very importantly, um, issues of evolutionary progress and direction were explicitly excluded from the modern evolutionary synthesis by the architects of, uh, of the synthesis themselves. Why did they do that? It's because they needed to establish evolutionary science as something serious. So they didn't want uh, the big picture to, to muddy the seriousness of uh, evolutionary science. Uh, but the, interest, the most interesting thing is that they all believed in, in a progress and direction. All these architects who banned these topics from publications, they actually believed in, in, in direction. And so if you want to see more details, this story is told in, in the great uh, historical book uh, by Michael Ruse, which is called Monad to Man, the concept of progress in evolutionary biology. And also the letter, I think, should mention an imperative to introduce the noosphere to educational curriculums to influence uh, next generation problem solvers. So this is not naive optimism, religious mythology, nor a childish utopia. Uh, <clears throat> yesterday, I learned the word protopia by, thanks to, to Kevin Kelly. So it's the idea that uh, a society is capable to become incre incrementally better. So we're not, it, yeah, if you think about um, utopia or dystopia, these are uh, fixed states of a society, something that, that is stable. But the, in the real world, we are, societies are very dynamic and, and change, especially now that we are in this accelerated tr transition. So, uh, so it gives a philosophy that we can improve things incrementally. Uh, and also it fits in pretty well with uh, the concept of the adjacent possible in, uh, in complexity science in, uh, on, as a methodology to deal with very complex systems. You can, you can just try to find, uh, assess where you are and find the, the best place to, to continue uh, next to, to this um, present assessment. And uh, yes, uh, also it's not denying the planetary threats. Uh, they are very real. Climate change, biodiversity loss, or nuclear war threats are, are very real. Uh, but I want you to consider this argument. Even, even if we would have a magic wand and we could neutralize all of these uh, great issues of, uh, at the planetary scale, we would still not have a future vision for our planet that could inspire next generation. Even if we had no nuclear war possible, uh, no climate change problem, um, and biodiversity was doing great, we still need a vision for the future. So the process and plan, <clears throat> please express your interest if you want to contribute to, to this open letter. 
and, or give general feedback. So I invite you to, to do it now. And then I propose that uh, a first outline and draft um, of the open letter will be uh, written by, by the, the top scholars. And then we would collect your com the comments and feedback of everybody. And then select about 20 co-authors with PhD degrees to lend further authority. So I know not everybody has a PhD. If you still want to help, you can, of course. And the first free person who writes their name on, on the Google Doc will get this delicious Belgian dark chocolate. <laughs> And then the process, hopefully, will be a publication in a high-impact scientific magazine. And uh, then this publication could be used uh, for a public relation consistent, consultant to further build on it and to create research, uh, sorry, outreach efforts. So in conclusion, it is really time to go beyond dominating collapse scenarios leading to fear, anxiety, and disorientation. Human energy's mission, as Ben said, is to steer humankind to a new age of human, and I would add planetary flourishing. And I feel like here today we are a community ready to tackle big issues. We are ready to face controversies and objections. We are ready to promote a vision that can positively impact humanity and the planet. Thank you very much. Fantastic presentation. Thank you so much, Clement. Um, I wonder, I know you probably put a lot of work into the subtitle with the word surviving. And I wonder if uh, a word like thriving or uh, prospering, flourishing, where you're focusing on the quality of life and all the scenarios where you would survive but get low quality life. I wonder if that might be a, a way to finesse not being accused of fear mongering, but instead saying, no, there is this positive vision and there's lots of ways we could survive but not be, not be flourishing. This is a great comment. Thank you. You make me realize that I fell into the trap of writing something viral, something uh, that is threatening the, the survival of humanity, but you're absolutely correct. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the title should be brainstormed also, definitely. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, uh, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Introduce yourself. I'm sorry. My name is Sean Kelly, uh, yeah, California Institute of Integral Studies, longtime colleague of Brian Swim. As somebody who evidently reads French, uh, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you have drawn from or have been inspired by the work of Edgar Morin, whose uh, volume six of Method, for instance, is about planetary ethics. Just uh, also your other colleague, uh, Pablo Servigne, uh, the head of the new discipline of collapsology, um, <clears throat> who introduces a slightly different perspective on uh, the question of anxiety, fear, disorientation around collapse, and rather than try to push it away, strategies for integrating it? Those two questions. Yes. Um, yes, I, I think I saw your abstract, actually, about Edgar Mora, and I was very intrigued uh, uh, about it, and I'm looking forward to, to listen to, to your talk. Uh, and I haven't, I, I, haven't read, um, I haven't read Edgar Mora, but I know he's... Uh, Definitely a great thinker and a great systems uh, thinker. And um, the other point about Pablo. Uh, yes, I know. I, I don't know his work, so I need to, to check it out. Uh, yeah. Just a small remark for Clement. Uh, he hasn't been uh, back in Clea for for a while. Uh, in the meantime, I have a PhD student who is making a PhD about Edgar Morin and his philosophy of uh, evolution of complexity. Uh, hi, Clement. That was great. <clears throat> uh, my name is Julian Goff. Uh, there's about nine, well, well over 99% of the world population do not have PhDs. 
and they have trouble reading letters written by PhDs. So, <laughs> which is not to critique in any way PhDs or guys with PhDs. Some of my best friends have PhDs. <laughs> but would it be interesting to perhaps explore the idea of, of two letters, one by PhDs for science and nature, and another high profile letter by high profile people that do not have PhDs for, for a publication perhaps that's high, also high profile but doesn't just do that? Yes. I absolutely agree with you. Maybe I went too quickly about it, but uh, so this last point in the in the plan is then to have a public relations consultant that would further build on the authoritative uh, uh, by PhD for PhD <laughs> letter, and, and then to to create a variety of uh, of, of much more accessible um, summaries. Cool. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Clement. Uh,